spoon carver for a living. This is it. This is what I do. It's um, a lot of people think because I was in the military, I've got a some sort of pension coming in, or or I don't. I don't have a pension. I don't have uh, hell. I don't have any kind of retirement program. Um, this is it. 100% spoons and related items, and uh, I sell probably 90% of them online. Uh, send them all over the world. The other 10% I sell at a local farmer's market. I sit there on Saturdays, yeah. kind of like I'm doing right now. I sit in this rocking chair and people come by and who's the freak with the knife? And, uh, you know, they, they get reintroduced to an age-old trade. Some people walk by me like I'm a bug. Oh, all right, that's your problem. But other people, they're like, you know, their tongue hits the floor and they're like, whoa, are you carving that spoon? Yeah. Born overseas, military family, six schools by sixth grade. Then I spent the next six years in the same school system. Joined the Navy, 13 years in military construction. Moved to Western New York, 20 years as a residential tradesman. We did it all, mostly carpentry. Uh, hated it. Hated it. Used to think up excuses not to go to work. And then I finally had the last day for the last time, walked off the job. Almost starved for the next year, making picnic tables and Adirondack chairs, hunting blinds, anything. But location, 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 location. I live on a unbusy road it turns into dirt and disappears into the forest anybody that drives by my house is either lost or they know right where they're going so it wasn't a great place to do a business like that all my contracting tools were old and worn out I didn't really want to go that route again I was thinking about well I had this lifelong dream of always wanting to have a furniture shop but that was going to take money I was debt free and I wanted to stay that way. And then I carved a spoon. I made spoons the first time in the late 80s. I was working in Virginia, Little Creek, uh, Virginia Beach. I was in an amphib unit. You know, CB's construction, but we had a carpenter shop where I had all those machines that every furniture maker dreams of. And I went to Williamsburg, Colonial Williamsburg was close. It was fun. I took pictures of all the little outbuildings. The thing that struck me the most in the whole day was their little store. Um, I found a spoon. It was made out of tulip poplar, you know, that green poplar. And it was the first spoon I ever saw that had crank. You know, it had, you know, it, some swoops and it was pretty. And I thought it didn't look hand carved. You know, it looked machined. But I was thinking, gee, I can make those. And I made a bunch, figured out how to do it, mostly with drum sanders and band saws. And I was giving them away for Christmas and. Then the Gulf War started, the first one, and my unit got deployed. And I came back, got divorced, went to Massachusetts, got forced out of the Navy by the drawdown. And so it was like 25 years when my niece, it was right about the end of that first year, you know, I'd been making picnic tables and starving for a year. She asked me if I remembered those spoons I had made and could I make her one? And I did. It wasn't easy, I didn't have any of those machines, but I got one out, and then another niece wanted some, and then I made a couple on my own, and I, uh, I just wondered, you know, Google's a wonderful thing, I wondered on Google, does anybody make a living 
making spoons. But I got the gist of it. You can use green wood, you can use a hatchet, a knife, uh, a hook, which I didn't have a hook, I started with a gouge. You know, it's been six and a half years now and thousands of spoons. But it's a thing, you can do this. And you're looking at my toolbox. I used to have to have a pickup truck and a trailer. I probably had $15,000 worth of tools on a job site any day. I can literally do this with three tools, and I can do it anywhere. I can walk up into the woods with a hatchet, a straight knife, a hook, and I can come back out at the end of the day with a pile of finished spoons. It's just, oh, kind of like nicotine. Once you get started, you can't stop. I'm not the only one who feels this, but once you get started, it's hard to stop. It's so simple. And um, when I did construction, I might I worked on projects that lasted years. You may never actually see the finished product. And that, especially if you're not making enough money at it, that can really wear you down. You know, there's no sense of accomplishment. You know, yeah, you're tired at the end of the day. You know you put in a good day. But it's like, well, where is that fulfillment? Where this, I started this spoon two hours ago. We've been fooling around, getting set up to do this. But in about another 15, 20 minutes, this thing is gonna be complete. It's a complete project that I made from a piece of wood that we dragged down this trail yesterday that from some tree that fell over. And um, the coolest thing is it's, it's just, you can do it anywhere, you can send them anywhere. Um, when I was a carpenter, I mean, I just, I had a life, but it wasn't, um, certainly wasn't international like spoons. I mean, I've got spoon friends all over the place, Russia, all over Europe, uh, Kuwait, Iran, uh, Israel. I sent spoons to, to Antarctica. I've got pictures of my spoons sitting on a friggin' glacier at the South Pole. It was 89th parallel. You can't get much lower than that. Um, yeah, so Monday morning, tomorrow's Monday I'm going to roll out of bed and it's going to be like that fat little kid, you know, rubbing his hands together it's like, <laughs> what do I get to make today and it's like that almost every day how do you get your wood? Mm. alright that is a question I get a lot where do you get your wood? When I first started, you know, the second time around, um, I wasn't I wasn't doing green wood yet. So I was going down to the local sawmill, and I was paying, you know, for some black walnut and maple. That stuff is. I have since learned that carving kiln dried wood is probably about as tough as it's going to be. It's hard on you, it's hard on your hands, it's hard on your tools. But then as, you know, watching more videos, talking with more people online, there was so much, there's such a big online community where people just discuss and share ideas and talk about tools and techniques. But harvesting, that's the coolest thing is I get to just walk through the woods, look for things that fell down. But where do I live? Um, Klipnaki State Forest, there's a uh, the legend of the hairy women. We've got big feet running around up there. I've never seen one. But um, I know where the hairy women are. They all live in my house. But uh, yeah, I actually got a, I actually got a request. This guy wanted to be make a clapper. He sent me a picture. He's like, "Can you make this?" I'm like, "What is it?" And he goes, "Well, the, you use it to communicate with big, with big feet. You know, it's like a, it was two pieces of wood with a hinge." I was like, "Well." Good luck, but I, I make spoons. So, but yeah, you don't have to cut trees. I know a lot of people freak out if you cut down a tree. Here I live where that's what, it's it's like wheat, you know. Proper management, um, there's always going to be trees. But everything I carve, by and large, has already been cut by somebody else. Uh, well, you can't see what I'm looking at, but roadside culling where they 
cut the trees back from the roadside. Um, that's where most of that's where I get my stuff. Once in a great while, I'll see a tree that's got a burl on it, or you know, it's the thing is nothing but a crook, a natural bent. Everything is perfectly bent for a spoon. And um, if it's a tree that should ought to come out of there, I'll take it. But mostly, it's just walking around, looking at stuff, and uh, I carry a backboard. It's, uh, it's an old military issue pack frame, and I just strap my wood. Uh, I don't have it with me, but I carry a tomahawk out in the woods, cut it to length, strap it onto my backpack, drag it home, process it into spoons. Some people are freak out. They're thinking, I'm not going to eat off a wooden spoon, am I? Filth, dirt. Um, I don't know. We had our ancestors ate off wood for years. They didn't die. Um, and there's, I won't get into all the science, but a, a, a properly washed wooden spoon is way cleaner than that plastic spoon you got at the ice cream store last week. When I first started spoon carving, well, making spoons, it was no big deal. I was, you know, just a guy working in my shop. But then I discovered, when I discovered greenwood spoon carving, you know, using basically raw wood from the woods, you know, there's, there's a community. Um, but at the time, this is, oh, I didn't catch the beginning of this crazed movement, but I was in the early stages. The oldest one is in Milan, Minnesota. That's here in the U.S. Uh, because I'm so far away from everything, I decided why not um, do one. You know, and Alex has been involved. And they come to carve spoons. It's crazy. I just do a free thing, but it's been fun because, you know, the people that were here when I got here laid the groundwork, and now they're everywhere. I know there's gatherings down in Tennessee. There's, um, they're having them in New England. They have them up in Maine. There's... You know, four or five hours away here in New York, there was one recently. And it's it's a pretty supportive community. It needs to be thinned a little. Black birch, hence Western Pennsylvania black birch, really close to the Allegheny National Forest. What does the future of craft look like to you? Like where do you see it going for you and like oh. how it's it going for the world? It's been a boon for tool sellers, people that make their own tools, companies like FlexCut and Mora. Um, personally, I don't see it ever getting easier to make money at it. I really don't. There's a lot of us doing it now. I don't. It'd be nice to think that it will, won't go away because it is, it's a useful, I mean, you're living closer to the land, you're making a product for people, it's not manufactured, I mean, God grew the tree, you found it, you've turned it into something you can use, and um, I think a lot of people are looking for that. I know that one of the reasons why spoon carving is so popular is because we've become such a spoiled, sedentary culture. I mean, most people don't even garden anymore. I mean, so this is something back to nature, you know. But as far as um, how long the outliers will keep going, I don't know. You know, the professionals, the guys that do this for a living, I don't plan on doing anything else. I, I don't plan on retiring, but as long as I can carve, I'll probably carve something. A lot of the schools, you know, the people, the people that go there, they just want to learn how to do it without cutting their arms off, and um, that's fine. Very few of them are actually gonna. Very few people are actually willing to take the step down in income it would take to do this full time. You know, most people that I know of that are carving spoons have a second income. They have a good job or they have a retirement. Um, 
you know, their wives aren't going to tolerate them selling their truck and their tools and staying home in the basement every day. I got lucky. <laughs> When Alex first asked this question, when he talked about trying to film the responses of spoon carvers, you know, he said, think about what does uh, Sloyd mean to you? And I kind of giggled and laughed. It's like, that's easy, one word, poverty. Um, so yeah, poverty. I'm as poor now as I have ever been financially, but I'm debt free still. I was able to keep that going but I'm, I'm richer now in so many ways I get to spend more time outside I get to spend almost every meal with my children um, my wife and I are the best of friends and we see each other all day every day and um, even Roscoe's in the mix but I'm so much richer for the experience to take the step down and step back from all the background noise and the clutter and the, I gotta have the latest gizmo um, which, as a carpenter, I was, I was, I always had to have a new truck. I had to have something that got me to work every day. I always had to have a new tool. So, Sloyd, my interpretation, this is certainly not the Swedish interpretation, um, slowing down, take a step back, turn off the television. Get outside. Just get out there and get to it. They, uh, I heard on the radio once that you should make your vocation your vacation. Well, it took me a long time, but I've been on vacation now for almost seven years. What do they say? Bon appetit. <laughs> carving it green, letting it dry, turning it into a, a spoon. I gave that a try, and it's night and day. And where I live, out here in the forest, I mean, look, I could probably get 30, 40 spoons out of that one tree that's already down. Um, some people, you know, they're looking for the perfect tree, and I understand that, but for a spoon, I only need a piece of wood a couple inches longer than the finished spoon and I'm in business, so I don't need to take a whole tree so that I can carry four feet of wood out of the woods. I love it. I grew up in the woods. My, uh, my family's from Vermont. My grandfather, my maternal grandfather had a farm. Um, he taught me how to fish. He taught me how to hunt. He was a logger himself as well as a dairy farmer. Um, had his own truck garden. You know, he was a brakeman for the railroad. He worked nights, but during the day, he was doing all this other outdoorsy stuff. Um, when it rained, we went fishing. When the sun was out, we worked. And um, being in the woods was part of that. And um, as a young boy, you know, teenager, I was carted overseas due to my father's military service, and there were no woods where I was. There's just something about the woods. It's natural, it's quiet. You can sleep on the ground out here and in a couple of days you don't have any issues. You don't have to watch the news. It doesn't matter who's doing what to you out here. Just gotta make sure something doesn't fall on your head and the big feet don't get you. My name is Pat. I sell spoons for a living. 